All right, hello everybody. I'm really excited to share with you work that I've been doing with Dr. Emily Dolson and Dr. Charles Ofria at Michigan State University, looking into building genome annotations for digital evolution systems to facilitate phylogenetic inference. My name is Matthew Moreno, and I'm a graduate student at Michigan State University, associated with the Beacon Center. So digital evolution refers to a really large class of computer models that are designed to instantiate the process of evolution in computer programs in, in order to better understand it and to study it. Uh, digital evolution is a really powerful tool in conjunction with uh, wet lab studies and natural history, um, given its unique capabilities such as fast generational tur turnover and the ability to do arbitrary experimental manipulations within these computer programs. So, Phylogenetic analysis, just like in other uh, fields of evolution research, is a really important tool in digital evolution uh, for a number of reasons, ranging from kind of understanding the evolution and hairy history of particular in innovations to studying spatial aspects of evolutionary innovation and uh, characterizing other aspects of uh, evolution as it unfolds in these digital evolution models. So digital evolution systems traditionally uh, use a perfect phylogenetic tracking approach to actually record uh, phylogenetic events as they occur in order to have a perfect record of the actual underlying phylogenetic relationships uh, between individuals within the simulation. So you can imagine this kind of like one centralized filing cabinet where all of the events in the simulation are routed there and then assembled to actually construct the phylogenetic tree as it occurs. And so this works great for traditional single-threaded, um, single CPU digital evolution experiments. However, when we scale up, things get more challenging. So in kind of traditional single CPU um, experiments. This might be something like having a small number of people all trying to use the same filing cabinet, but when you scale up you can really easily imagine how kind of contention and the possibility of crashed processes or lost data introduces um, issues with respect to this kind of centralized phylogenetic tracking model. And so what we're interested in in, in this work is understanding how we can apply a reconstruction model to uh, digital evolution instead of a necessarily a tracking model. So um, uh, phylogenetic reconstruction is how you're used to thinking about phylogenetics in uh, natural history and wet lab systems where you have some group of extant organisms and you analyze their uh, genetics and um, by comparing their genomes among uh, your extant organisms, you can actually do inference and estimate the underlying uh, phylogenetic tree, even though you weren't tracking it as it actually occurred. And so the really key core question of our work is the realization that in digital evolution systems, we actually control how genomes work and how they're inherited, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we design the genomes in our digital evolution system to maximize and uh, facilitate uh, phylogenetic reconstruction um, from a set of extant digital organisms at the end of a simulation. So um, to prime our thinking, I'm going to start by sharing kind of a naive approach we might think to, to actually solve this problem. So. Um, we could imagine having a simple bit string uh, genome that's just a set of ones and zeros, and as generations elapse, um, when the genome is inherited by an offspring, we just apply some prob with some probability or some fraction random bit flips, random mutations in the genome, right? So this goes on, and here we've got an event where um, the organism at generation two had two offspring. We apply a random mutation to both of those. Continuing, continuing, say the simulation ends at generation five, we grab our two extant organisms and we can compare the number of sites that they have in common versus the number of sites that are different and do some math to infer some kind of an estimate of about how many generations 
um, elapsed um, between these two extant organisms back to their um, most common ancestor, most recent common ancestor, which was in this case at generation two. However, as I, I think many of you are aware, this kind of naive approach um, has a lot of issues and subtleties, you know, with the, the possibility of back mutations, um, mutational saturation, tuning the mutational rate, and then also being able to detect uneven branch lengths um, uh, between the extant organisms and the most recent common ancestor. And so the kind of more clever approach that we've been working on, uh, we call it hereditary stratigraphy. And I'll just kind of introduce how it works to you by example. So in this approach, um, instead of having a fixed length genome, we have a um, genome that's gonna grow over time. We start off with just a single packet of randomly generated data that we call a fingerprint. And when a reproduction event occurs, an offspring inherits their parent's fingerprint and then generates a new randomly generated fingerprint, right? And so you can see this happening with the actual kind of random bits of data in the fingerprints here represented by the different colors of these little packets. So we've got that same fork event, um, do a few more generations, grab our extant organisms, and now in order to determine uh, an estimate of the most recent common ancestor of these two extant organisms. We uh, just line them up and compare them, and we know that they share common ancestry where those two randomly generated fingerprints are in common, and then we can see um, where they actually differentiate and then have independent lineages um, after uh, generation three about, right? So that's really the main idea of our approach. And so we refer to this as a hereditary stratigraph kind of um, as an analogy to kind of geological stratigraphy where you're studying layers that accumulate over time. But the, the big idea here is that this, and this genome and inheritance system can actually be appended to any other digital evolution system that you're trying to study. So if it's bit strings in an NK landscape, you can append a hereditary stratigraph, if it's full-fledged, maybe a Vita-style computer programs that are being evolved to solve some kind of a logic task, you can have everything going on that you normally have and just append this neutral annotation. And so um, I, some of you probably have anticipated the major hang-up with this um, seemingly more clever approach, the hereditary stratigraphy approach, is um, the fact that the genome is growing as generations elapse. And so in digital evolution systems, it wouldn't be unusual to see, you know, maybe on the order of hundreds of thousands or millions of generations. And as you can see, as these generations elapse and the genomes grow and grow, suddenly we've got a lot of extra data that we're slinging around our simulation that's gonna take up space, right? So um, the approach that we've come up with to uh, address this issue is by pruning the um, uh, the genome annotation and kind of throwing away some of the fingerprints that we don't need in order to trade off, make a very direct trade off between kind of the uncertainty that we can have about exactly when the most recent common ancestor between two organisms was and the um, space that these fingerprints are taking up inside of our computing system. And so um, when we throw away fingerprints, suddenly we have these windows and kind of the number of fingerprints that we throw away determines the width of the windows and the ability uh, through these comparisons to kind of nail down exactly where the most recent common ancestor occurred. And so this pruning is actually the really interesting and subtle part that I'm gonna fast forward through here in a little, a little bit in the interest of time. Happy to take questions or correspond about it further. Um, but one thing that I will mention is that we have a lot of choices that we can make about how to prune, right? And so one really interesting choice that we've been exploring is should we prune evenly throughout evolutionary history or should we prune more heavily on kind of more ancient sites, the idea being that having um, tighter information about more recent events um, is generally more useful, that we're willing to tolerate 
um, higher absolute uncertainty for more ancient events compared to more, more recent phylogenic events. So um, kind of uh, next I'll talk about some of the preliminary work that we've been doing with this system. Um, I'll fast forward through it a little bit um, just in the interest of time so that we have lots of time for questions and answers. Um, but we've been taking this system and applying it to uh, different uh, um, to digital evolution simulations under different selection schemes, uh, different kind of evolutionary conditions, and comparing the uh, phylogenies that we're able to reconstruct using uh, up GMA reconstruction uh, of kind of all of those pairwise MRCA distances between the extant organisms to an actual ground truth phylogeny that we actually recorded inside of the system, right? So we're comparing our reconstruction to, in this case, we actually have the exact truth that we're trying to um, reconstruct. And um, we've been getting uh, pretty good um, quality reconstructions, um, recovering about half of the information in the, um, in the phylogeny. Um, uh, Dr. Dolson has put together an amazing interactive visualization where you can see uh, uh, the algorithm in action kind of across these different evolutionary conditions. Um, so I'd encourage you to check it out at that link. Um, but I just want to take a moment to really highlight kind of the high level takeaways that I hope that you'll be leaving this presentation with. The first being kind of this interesting backwards problem that we're running into in digital evolution systems where in natural systems, you're kind of stuck with um, you know, the genomes that nature gave you and you have to do the best quality phylogenetic reconstructions you can with what you have. But in these digital evolution systems, we are having this weird opportunity to try to design the uh, genomes that we're actually doing the inference on in order to make inference as easy as possible. So that raises a bunch of really interesting questions about what's useful for inference and kind of um, maybe even like theoretically, what's the best quality inference that we can do given, you know, a certain amount of, um, uh, you know, bits of information in the genome or something like that. Uh, and future work with the system, we're interested in exploring uh, sexual populations. All the stuff I've been talking about here assumes asexual reproduction. Um, and uh, better understanding, um, especially, you know, the theoretical expectations that we can have for how good the reconstructions will be uh, given um, kind of the trade-offs that we make in uh, the uh, retention policies, the kind of the strata that we throw away to save space. So there's, there's really interesting avenues for work there. Um, I'll credit the images that I use in this presentation. Um, the bibliography, and I'll acknowledge my co-authors, and then end with some links, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you.